Welcome to the 70th Annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. The topic this year is immunity and tolerance. I'm Lori Dempsey, a senior editor at Nature Immunology. And with me is Dr. Ann O'Gara, who is uh, one of the co-organizers of, of this conference this year. And she is head of the Division of Immunoregulation at the MRC National Institute of Medical Research in Mill Hill, London. And welcome. Thank you, Lori. And thank you to Cold Spring Harbor for holding these interviews to let us share um, our future at views on research in immunology, where it's going and where it's at. Yes, yes. I, I have to first commend you that you've done a wonderful job in organizing this meeting, uh, you and your co-organizers. And uh, also, you're a pioneer in, in cytokine research and uh, you know, at the forefront of when a lot of these uh, uh, solid bill molecules that are influencing both the, the um, development of, of immune cells as well as their activity, uh, discovery of these as well as the, the pathways and, and what they elicit in terms of, of uh, effective functions. And so give us a little bit of background of you know, where things were and then uh, where things are, are progressing. Yes, yeah, so um, in fact, I was asked to be a co-organizer on the meeting, um, I think by Michelle Bruce Stillman, their idea was that I would bring the cytokine dimension, immunoregulation, infection, and also human disease into the picture and try and attract speakers complementing the molecular theme that Cold Spring Harbor has had yes. uh, for so many years um, and, you know, its famous history. So myself, well, I started off doing a PhD in bacterial adhesion at the National Institute for Medical Research. And then after a few years, I thought uh, I would like to work on cellular differentiation yes. and the immune response and the hemopoietic system was perfect for studying that. Yes, yes. So I took a postdoc position. I changed fields. I changed divisions, even though I stayed in the Institute at Mill Hill to work on cytokines and B-cell growth and differentiation. And then I moved to the uh, exciting institute, DNAX Research Institute uh, in That's California where I meant to work for two years, but I stayed 15. <laughs> this was an institute which was pioneering cytokine research. Um, there was the discovery of Th1 and Th2 cells by Mossman and Kaufman. Right, and furthermore, great. one cytokine cloned after the other with immunologists who could define assays in which to test them. And in fact, that led the cloning of these cytokines. So everybody was like in all one place and so looking at different So it was aspects. all in one place, very interactive. And coming from NIMR, which is a cross-disciplinary uh, collaborative institute to DNAX was perfect. So there's a lot of interaction and my uh, first uh, work was on B cells, but then I was asking the question is how do, um, how does the beginning of the immune response influence whether you get these Th1 cells that make gamma interferon and protect against intracellular pathogens or these Th2 cells that make our four and other cytokines as we heard about today that protect mm -hmm. against helminths. And we came up with a differentiation assay um, and collaborated actually with Ken Murphy on the development of here, this yeah. pathway, which is Th1 driven by AL-12, and Ken Murphy is also a speaker uh, here at the, at the meeting, now working on dendritic cell development. And then a very important cytokine was discovered at DNAX, which actually regulates the immune response, uh, down-regulates uh, immune responses to pathogens and to flora, uh, interleukin-10, and my lab worked out the mechanism of action of how IL-10 inhibited macrophages and dendritic cells from stimulating the immune response. Then. Uh, uh, the IL-10 knockout was made by uh, Werner Muller and Klaus Rajewski. Klaus Rajewski is also here. And then it was worked out at DNAX that it had inflammatory bowel disease. And in fact, then uh, regulatory T cells and IL-10 producing T cells, Fiona Parry, who was also at the meeting, uh, worked on colitis and so uh, these models. The key so we've got key here. players in cytokine, uh, immune response to infection, regulation of pathology, and so my lab did a lot of work on identifying how cytokines were induced, how they drove the different immune responses, and how they functioned to block, um, to block pathology or to promote uh, the right immune response against an intracellular pathogen. And for example, IL-10, where we blocked it, allowed uh, these Th1 responses to be uh, induced in response to soluble antigen, which has implications for vaccination, but also was important uh, in against intracellular pathogens. So IL-10 on the one hand would inhibit colitis mm -hmm. or inflammatory bowel disease or other uh, immune pathologies, but on the other hand, it suppresses immune response. And so 
When I went back to the National Institute for Medical Research, it was after 15 years in California, and uh, the goal then was to, I, my mandate was to start a new division, mm -hmm. and the mandate was to uh, interface immunology and infectious disease, because in the world... Yeah. I say, th all that work was also just in the mouse system, or do you have any human work at that? In DNAX, no? um, I mainly worked in the mouse system, and uh, for 10 years, Bob Kaufman and I had um, joint lab meetings every two weeks together to exchange research, but then we had a human immunology component of the institute, Hergen Spitz, Jan de Vries, and others, yes, yes. who actually then validated in human what we found in mouse, and actually this caused a lot of debate, because right. at the beginning, the question was whether TH1 and TH2 existed in human. Well, indeed they do. And in fact, human TH1 and TH2 are going to be recognized this year um, uh, um, at some stage later on in the year with good um, um, accolades, uh, which I won't go okay, into. Okay, it sounds like you have some, some, some but <laughs> I information. Yes. Okay. Uh, but let's go back to, to your, your move back to, to uh, NIMR. So I looked at various uh, institutes around uh, Europe. Uh, my long-term partner husband actually lives in Paris and is at the Pasteur Institute. He actually cloned Dal 10. Yes, he yes. works on B-cell development, Paolo Vieira. However, I, having looked at France, uh, England, I chose London and I chose the National Institute for Medical Research because there is where cross-disciplinary interaction happens and collaborative research. And my job was to go back and start a division to bring about interactions between people working on the immune response and people working on the infections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I was to recruit uh, group leaders who would work on these different uh, infections in the immune and the immune response on them. So at that stage, I was about 48 years old, 47. I thought maybe it's time that I really took my research to something that's devastated to man and really studied infection in an important pathogen system. Uh, because of my background, AL12, TH1, gametophoron, um, and uh, in addition, the, work, the fact that I'd worked on bacteria uh, to start with, um, mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, infection became the target of my own research, and that was only about six, eight years ago, so I'm a newcomer to the field. Um, tuberculosis still kills about 1.4 million people, disease, yeah. devastating disease. Diagnosis is very difficult. You can't do it in a lot of people because you have to get sputum. Um, we don't understand all the protective measures of the immune response. We know gametophoron, AL12, TNF are important, but they're seen in people with active disease. Right, so right. what else is going on? And then as an immunologist, what fascinated me most is that a third of the world has been exposed or infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, but, but the people remain healthy. Right, right. So all you can say is that these people are healthy, they've been exposed, they're positive for a skin test or a blood assay for interferon and MTB antigens, but this can only tell you that they've been exposed. The only way you can distinguish between active TB and latent is that people have disease or they don't. So an ex, uh, chest X-ray? Chest X-ray, which um, you know is not always that specific. Right, right, so right. you're trying to figure out what people may have. And then culture of the bug, you may culture it, but still the people may be latent, so it's not enough. And, and again, just the culturing is a lengthy period. It takes like months. weeks, months, and then uh, on top of this, because the drugs are arduous, right. six months of very toxic pills, there is poor compliance, and as we heard from Bill Jacobs at this meeting, um, problem with the drug you resistance. get drug resistance. Yes, so yes. we wanted to understand what is the immune response in active TB and latent TB. The latent in protection, the active TB, why do people go on to get this chronic disease? Right, right, right. And actually, I thought we started the mouse models of TB and we still keep them because they're very important to have experimental models to test right, our right. hypothesis and pathways in. Um, but in latent and active TB, the only way you were going to look at this was in human. Okay. But this was very complicated because it's a, such a complicated disease of the lung. Right. can become uh, invading other orga organs. So this coincided with a visit to the Baylor Institute of Immunology Research in about 2004, 2005, where I was thinking, how am I going to study this complex disease? Right. And I sat at the computer of Virginia Pasquale, who is a He's pediatric rheumatologist, who is also here and will be giving a talk this afternoon, in the institute headed by Jacques Bonchereau, and they were using a blood transcriptional signature to reveal pathogenesis in autoimmune diseases. Now, these were systemic autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. However, we thought maybe this can reveal something about active TB, even though right, it's a right disease right. of a lung. To cut it short, we defined a blood signature of active TB. So you're getting a, uh, cells from the blood doing transcriptal 
uh, assays of these and try just seeing what's being expressed in, in Absolutely. peripheral blood Absolutely. And uh, what cells. I emphasize is that, um, so blood is recruited from the patients before you even have the full diagnosis. It has okay. to be before treatment. Then RNA is isolated, and then, as you say, uh, microarray, subjected to microarray. And the analysis that we did really is what people should do is an unbiased, unsupervised analysis mm -hmm. where you look at what's driving the disease, not right, what okay. genes I know about and I'm interested in working on, but what is driving the disease. And so what looking we for new biomarkers. Is just looking for a new systematic, yes. systemic approach of what's happening in the whole immune response, okay. as opposed to pathway by pathway, cell by cell, as I've done for 20 years. And this extreme was extremely powerful because we defined a signature in active TB. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This was this transcriptional response with genes overexpressed or underexpressed in active TB that was missing in the majority mm -hmm. of latent and in mm -hmm. healthy controls. And then what we were most surprised at is that this signature represented various clusters of genes and we used mm -hmm. uh, good bioinformatic tools that helped us to analyze the mm -hmm data without bias right, right, and, that's and what came out is that not only was the gamma interferon inducible genes that you'd expect in TB because that's the pathway evoked but we found type 1 interferon inducible genes turned on mm -hmm. and it turns out that type 1 interf interferon and the genes induced by it in certain mouse models such as listeria had been suggested to cause the chronic infection of pathogenesis. So actually type 1 interferon is detrimental. Is bad okay. for bacterial many bacterial infections. And indeed in tuberculosis this is the case. And in fact we've been able to show that um, it had been shown with clinical isolates and a particular strains of mice that type 1 inter interferon was involved in causing pa uh, chronic infection. But nobody bit this. And the reason is because we need to improve the mouse models to more resemble the human disease. Right. And just to back up, the, t the interferon gamma, though, is, is beneficial. So you have... Exactly. Okay. So you have these two different pathways, interferon gamma and type 1 interferon. And in fact, what we're finding is that type 1 interferon now induces the suppressive cytokine IL-10 that we know contributes to chronic it's infection. It's a full circle, isn't it? And it's a full circle. So my research, clinical research program, has met my basic research program, and it's providing information which is actually discovery research in yeah. human disease that is then feeding to do the molecular pathways of regulation of the immune response and then we're finding that type 1 interferon is actually blocking the right response that you need to clear tuberculosis so, so now with this information what are the challenges for the future so there are many challenges on the one hand even though i'm not a clinician i interact very closely with clinicians and we are obliged to push our signature to become a supportive diagnostic and a way to monitor drug treatment because the only way you can do this is with sputum clearance at the moment so it's a way it takes of two early months intervention once you had that signature exactly so we can know whether the drug is working on people within six days to two weeks because okay. the signature disappears upon successful treatment and so you can test new drugs on multi-drug resistant. You can right. test them on, on different patients and see that the drugs are working. Maybe they haven't got TB, in which case the signature will not change. So that's the clinical side. And we're also doing a longitudinal study to see if our signature mm. in a, a small number of latent individuals actually had the signature. Okay. So we're following these individuals to see, is this going to predict that they get to when they go uh, active, active disease? So that's the implications for TB and the disease itself, but we're collaborating with people all around the world, uh, people working on uh, drug-resistant TB, et cetera, and uh, various aspects of TB uh, as a disease. So your work really can impact uh, globally really on, on, on the care of patients. And yeah. I did it really to understand the immune response in tuberculosis and what could have caused the people to go on to get mm -hmm. disease. But now it has these also clinical implications where we may help to improve uh, drug uh, uh, patient management. But on the other hand, it also gives you big uh, alarm bells for vaccination because a lot of the adjuvants that are used for vaccination turn on type 1 interferon. If you've got people who have latent TB and they're just, these people with latent TB could have subclinical yeah. uh, TB that they're just about to burst out um, and you don't know this. So our signature may be able to predict right, these right. people and avoid the vaccine. But also, you need to have to worry about type 1 interferon signals and giving you adverse yeah. effects. And yeah. in fact, the um, vaccine that has just finished clinical trials phase 3, led by Helen McShane 
and a big consortium in South Africa um, uh, worldwide uh, led to it. Um, this uh, vaccine has now failed, mm. and uh, the, the adjuvant was an MVA, which is a modified vaccinia ankara, a backbone with an antigen from TB, and of course, what does MVA do? Turn on type 1 interferons. Okay, well so I think that has implications. Now back to the basic researcher, because I'm a basic researcher at heart, and I want to understand pathways of cytokine regulation, how you get the right protection, mm -hmm. and then how you basically stop uh, pathology and disease. Um, and so now the type 1 interferon pathway has fed us into looking at all downstream molecules of type 1 interferon, how they could be impairing the mm -hmm. response to mm -hmm. tuberculosis. Th mechanistic understanding of exactly. these Exactly. And, and then type 1 interferon blocking uh, the gamma interferon pathway, which is required for intracellular pathogen activation. So what can I recommend to the future of uh, immunology and infectious disease research and actu actually research across the board of uh, biology and biomedical research is that I think we can use human disease to make discoveries yes. about pathways and these discoveries can be then be used, one in the human disease to improve the mouse models to look more like the human disease. Of course we need the experimental models such as mouse or a zebrafish, as Lalita Ramakrishnan spoke about also in our session, uh, Mycobacterium marinum, a model of MTB infection. We need these experimental models because then we can perturb the pathways and figure out the pathways for um, immune regulation and activation. Um, but in addition, um, we need to use these uh, models to then improve the system and then work out the mechanism in innate cells and lymphoid cells from both experimental models and human disease or uh, healthy humans to figure out basic discovery of how the immune response is turned on and turned off um, for protection or, or the worse. Okay. Anna Guerra, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.